Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Just Love in Person Sunday message. And happy Valentine's Day to everyone. Today is yet another day that reminds us to have love for everyone and spread love to everyone. And there are so many ways to do so. This past week, Just Love in Person was able to spread love by providing care bags for foster care children in our community. Just a small way to acknowledge that we are all connected and that we should support each other. And that was a point that Miss Tawana Seats made last Sunday in My Father's Daughter, The Life and Legacy of Herschel B. Seats by Tawana Seats. In that Just Love Story special edition, Miss Seats spoke on how her father sought to uplift the black citizens of Person County and help the community as a whole be unified in love. If you have not seen that story yet, please go back and watch on our website, Facebook page, or YouTube channel. And while you're at it, check out our first Just Love story on Reverend Rachel and Mr. Charles Barnett, which was published February 2020. Their words provided great guidance on marriage, family, and following Christ. But before you go check out those great stories, please join me for today's Sunday message entitled, Go Where the Spirit Leads, Part 3. And I pray that you all have a love-filled Valentine's Day. Hello all and welcome to the Just Love in Person Sunday message. This is the finale of our three-part message, Go Where the Spirit Leads. And it's the culmination of a storyline that starts back in Act 6, that we began focusing on four weeks ago with the message, Let the Lord Use You. In that message, we talked about how in Acts 6, the apostles asked the church body to appoint seven men who would aid the apostles by managing the food distribution to the widows. These men were the originators of a new title in the church called diakonos, which means servant, in light of their assignment to serve food. Today in English, we refer to this group as deacons. We talked about how one of these deacons, Stephen, while being a server of food, was also called by God to preach the gospel and was gifted with the ability to perform miracles and wonders, as was the case for the apostles. This Stephen came into a dispute with some other Jews over his preaching of Jesus. And when they saw that his logic and biblical evidence outweighed theirs, they determined to just lie on him and have him arrested and brought before the Jewish religious leaders under false claims of blasphemy. But Deacon Stephen didn't defend himself before these religious leaders. Rather, he continued to preach the gospel, starting way back in Genesis with Abraham. And he rebuked the religious leaders for their unbelief. Upon that rebuke, the men grabbed Stephen and took him to be stoned. But as the men were murdering him, Stephen saw the heavens open up and the Lord Jesus sitting at the right hand of the throne, welcoming him to paradise. A confirmation of Stephen's faith and a reward for letting the Lord use him. As we reach the conclusion of Stephen's story, we learn in Acts 7, 58 and 8 and 1 that a man named Saul presided over Stephen's execution. He was the organizer, so to speak, of this murder, and he was the key figure in the persecution of the church in Jerusalem, which followed Stephen's murder. We spoke about this Saul in part one of Go Where the Spirit Leads. We talked about how he was from Tarsus, a city in modern-day Turkey, which means he was not born within the confines of ancient Israel. Therefore, he bore the title of a Hellenist, a Greek-speaking Jew with more Greek than Hebrew cultural influences. We spoke about how this may have led to Saul seeking to prove his Jewishness by being more fervent about the Jewish religious customs. We know that he spent formative years in Jerusalem learning to be a Pharisee under the famed Jewish scholar Gamaliel. We also know that he was proud of his heritage as a descendant of the tribe of Benjamin. 
likely because that tribe in ancient times had been loyal to the crown and didn't split from Judah when the ten other tribes went north and created their own kingdom. So Saul was extremely zealous and loyal to the Jewish religious customs, and perhaps therefore he saw the followers of Jesus as blasphemers and troublemakers. Thus he targeted the deacon Stephen and spearheaded the first persecution of the church. Acts 8 and 3 says, Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. These actions forced the believers to flee from Jerusalem and seek safety in other parts of Judea and surrounding regions. But chapter 8 verse 4 tells us that wherever they went, they proclaimed the gospel. And to that point, we were introduced to a second deacon named Philip, who, like Stephen, was called by God to preach the gospel and have been given the ability to perform miracles and signs. This Philip was the original subject of this three-part message, Go Where the Spirit Leads, in that he followed the Spirit's lead to a place where no good Jew would go, Samaria. Philip started his ministry in a Samaritan city and led many idol worshipers and those who followed sorcery to Christ. His work was so great that the apostles in Jerusalem heard about it and sent the two foremost apostles, John and Peter, to check it out. And from there, John and Peter joined Philip in his work in that city, praying over the new believers that they would receive the Holy Spirit. And seeing the Samaritans receive salvation, John and Peter went through Samaria, preaching Christ and setting up church communities all throughout the region, turning Samaria from a place where good people don't go to a place filled with good people. But Philip's work didn't stop in Samaria. We learn in part two of this message that Philip was again led by the Spirit to a particular place this time the road that connects Jerusalem to Gaza. To follow the Spirit this time, Philip had to go back to Jerusalem, which had become a dangerous place for Jesus' followers because of Saul. But Philip made it to his destination, that being a lonely, dusty road leading west out of the capital city. In other words, Philip trusted God enough to follow him through life-threatening danger and follow him to the middle of nowhere with no other directive but to go. And God trusted Philip enough to send him. Now we saw in chapter 8, verses 27 through 29, that Philip noticed a carriage with an Ethiopian noble inside and it was headed back to Ethiopia from Jerusalem, where the noblemen had gone to worship the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord then gave Philip his instruction. He told Philip to approach the carriage, and when Philip did so, he heard the man reading Isaiah 53, which speaks of the suffering Messiah. Philip then volunteered to explain the passage to the Ethiopian, and beginning with those verses, Philip preached of the promised Messiah, and proclaimed that Jesus was he. The Ethiopian man believed and asked to be baptized in a random pool of water that they came upon in their journey. Philip then baptized him into the body of believers, but immediately upon coming out of the water, Philip was whisked away by the Spirit. Verse 39 says the Ethiopian went his way rejoicing which obviously marked the gospel's very early entry into sub-Saharan Africa. Philip, on the other hand, was transported to Azotus, where he went his way preaching the gospel along the coast. And so as we noted in part two, when we go where the Spirit leads, we are able to experience the awesome wonders of God just like Philip did. But now, while Philip was going from city to city, 
preaching the gospel. And while the church was growing in the cities where believers had scattered to, Saul was plotting how he could destroy the church, not just in Jerusalem, but everywhere. And that's where we begin with our text for today. Chapter 9 starts off this way. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. What we see here is that Saul requested permission from the religious leaders in Jerusalem to go to another city, Damascus, and hunt down Jesus' followers who at this time were not yet called Christians, but had called their group the way. And he had determined that he would hunt down those who belonged to the way by going into synagogues to find them. Because remember, this first generation of believers still worshiped in synagogues because to them, Jesus was the fulfillment of Judaism. And as we know, they preached the gospel in those synagogues to try to convince their fellow Jews that Jesus was their Messiah. So Saul made the long journey from Jerusalem to Damascus to terrorize Jesus' followers. But upon getting close to the city, something incredible happened. Verses 3 and 4 tell us, that just as Saul was about to enter into Damascus, a heavenly light engulfed him, virtually knocking him to the ground. And a voice called out to him saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul, who needless to say was terrified at this point said, who are you Lord? Now I find it interesting that he called this voice Lord while claiming that he didn't know whose voice it was. And what I gather from that is that Saul, who knew very well whom he had been persecuting, had now come face to face with his worst fear, that Jesus really is Lord. The Jesus whom he had been trying to stamp out really was who his followers said he was. And now, here was Saul, face to face with him, being called out by him. And it reminds me of that statement from Hebrews 10, 31. It is a fearful thing to be in the hands of the living God. Saul at this point knew, or at least believed, that he was in big trouble. But look at what Jesus said to him. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goat. That second sentence, it is hard for you to kick against the goads, has what is called textual criticism attached to it, which means that there is debate about whether it was in the original text. We must understand that the Bible, particularly the New Testament, has the most preserved and plentiful ancient copies of any text in the history of the world. So there are many preserved handwritten copies of the New Testament from within the first couple of centuries of these events. And anytime there's textual criticism on a particular sentence or word, it's because some of the most ancient copies do not have that sentence or word in them. Or the sentence is written slightly different than how it has been printed in later versions. In these cases, the cause is most likely that a scribe made a slight error in copying. Because remember, these were hand copied way back then. Or that a side note that a scholar had made during their studying was accidentally copied by someone else as part of the original text and was included in later translations, which perhaps happened here. But now we can trust the veracity of our Bible because there are so many ancient copies that we can use to verify it with. And because we have so many ancient copies, 
we can see that there are very few words in our text today that are different from what we see in most ancient copies. And none of them change the actual point of the passages that they are in. For that reason, some translations like the NIV just go ahead and omit disputed sentences and words altogether. And others like the New King James put a notation beside them. And that's what we see here in the second sentence of Jesus' response in verse 5. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. If you're reading from the NIV, you don't see that sentence at all. We don't need it. If you're reading from the New King James, there's some type of marker beside it to let you know that the sentence is not found in some of the earliest manuscripts of the New Testament. Now, again, with that textual criticism there, it doesn't mean Jesus didn't say it. It just means that some ancient copies leave it out. So there is debate. But let's ponder what Jesus would have meant by that statement if indeed it was part of his original response to Saul. Goats were like cattle prods, spike sticks and poles that were used to force cattle to go where you want them to go. And if an animal got irritated or rebellious and tried to go against the goats that he was already being poked with, it would only hurt him more. Therefore, the phrase, kick against the goads, was a popular one during this time period to refer to a beast only hurting itself more by trying to be rebellious, even though in the end he was going to go where the cattle driver wanted him to go anyway. And so if Jesus saying to Saul, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, it's hard to kick against the goads, he would have been saying, it doesn't matter how much you rebel, how much you lash out, how much you try to ignore me, how violent you get. You belong to me and you're going to do what I want you to do. You may have come here with the goal of persecuting my people, but you belong to me. I have plans for you and no matter how hard you kick, I'm going to make you follow my plans for you. And there are plenty of people who can relate to that. You had a plan for yourself, whether it was a sinful plan or just a self-centered, self-focused plan. And God said, nope, that's not my plan for you. And you can kick and scream and run and hide and whatever else, but you belong to me and you're going to do what I want you to do. And right now, there are some of us who are still in the planning stage, trying to craft our own lives outside of God's commands and others who are in the running stages. To both groups, I say, stop kicking against the goads. You can't escape God's plans. He's already called you to his work, and there's nothing you can do but go where he sends you. It's like what God told Jeremiah. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. Don't tell me what you can't do because you're going to go to all whom I send you and whatever I command you, you shall speak. And just as it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, how wondrous is it to be in possession by the living God, to be claimed by him, for him to desire you, for him to plan out your life and arrange your coming and your going. So the statement that is attributed to Jesus in verse 5 says, it's hard to kick against the goads. You are mine and you're going to go where I send you and you're going to do what I tell you to do. And Saul, trembling and astonished, replied in verse 6, Lord, what do you want me to do? From there, we see that Saul was blinded and he had to be led into the city by the men who were with him. And he sat in his lodging place for three days blind, neither eating nor drinking. Meanwhile, verse 10 tells us that there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And Jesus came also to Ananias in a vision. He told him, 
Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying. And in the vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, so that he might receive his sight. Ananias answered Jesus, saying, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. And Ananias was protesting this assignment that he had been given. Essentially, he too was kicking against the goads, trying not to do what he was being made to do. And we can all understand. Imagine that you are Ananias and you're being told to go help Saul. Saul. Of all people, Saul. Now, Ananias was not among the Jerusalem believers who had fled Saul's persecution. He was already living in Damascus, where surely he would have thought that he was safe. Damascus is a long, long way from Jerusalem. In fact, Damascus is not even within the confines of ancient Israel. Damascus is in Syria, a neighboring country to the northeast. Ananias would have been nestled into the Jewish community in Damascus and would have been accompanied by quite a few fellow believers in that community. And because they were separated from the political drama of Jerusalem and the hate that the Jewish leaders had for Jesus, Ananias had not yet had to worry about being persecuted by Damascus Jews for proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah. But then he got word that Saul was branching out his operation and he was headed not to Samaria, not to Nazareth, not to Capernaum, but to Damascus. Can you imagine Damascus? He's coming all the way up here to Damascus. He's passing all those other cities to get to Damascus. And immediately Ananias found himself in the line of fire. I picture that he spent sleepless nights wondering how he might make his escape or trying to figure out who he could rely on to not snitch him out to Saul. And now the Lord Jesus has come to him in a vision to tell him to go to Saul. Go to Saul. And Ananias told Jesus, Well, Lord, you know, I've heard a lot about this man. How much harm he's doing to your people down in Jerusalem. And you know, he's been given permission to come here and do the same thing. But Jesus said to Ananias, Go. Go. And isn't that the point of our message? Go where the Spirit leads. You have some issues with what you're being asked to do, but go. You have some fears about where you're being sent, but go. You're uneasy about those whom you're being sent to, but go. Trust God and go. Be trustworthy in God's eyes as someone whom he can send. Don't kick against the goads. Go where the spirit leads. But now Jesus didn't just stop at go when he was talking to Ananias. He told Ananias why he needed to go. Jesus said, because this Saul is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles kings and the children of Israel and I'm sending you to open his eyes so I can show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake and so Ananias like Philip in chapter 8 obeyed the Lord and he went verses 17 through 19 tell us Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him he said brother Saul the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Because Ananias went where the Lord sent him, he was able to be used by God to perform a miracle. Remember what we talked about in part two, Amazing Wonders and Works. He was able to be used by God to perform a miracle and give Saul his sight back. And he also was used by God to fill Saul with the Holy Spirit and baptize Saul into the body of Christ. Just as we said in part one, when we go where the Spirit leads, God will use us to bring people out of the darkness into the marvelous light. And then the text tells us that Saul spent time with the disciples at Damascus. The very people for whom he came to Damascus to do harm, Saul ended up fellowshipping with them and becoming enmeshed with them, becoming a brother to them. The feared and murderous Saul became a disciple of Jesus Christ. But it doesn't stop there. Verses 20 through 22 tell us that Saul immediately began preaching in the synagogues that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. And all those Jews were perplexed and amazed because this was the one who destroyed those in Jerusalem, who called on the name of Jesus. And he was coming here to Damascus to do the same thing. But now he's preaching the name Jesus. Now, three weeks ago, when I first mentioned Saul, I said that he was perhaps the man most responsible for the gospel spreading beyond Jerusalem. And I said that with a wink, because it was not just his persecution that caused the gospel to spread, but it was also his ministry once he became a follower of Christ that spread this gospel to the corners of the globe. For those who do not yet realize, this Saul is the one whom we know today as the Apostle Paul, the most productive evangelist in human history, who spent the rest of his life traveling and preaching the gospel and building up church communities throughout the Roman Empire. The Apostle Paul, the most prolific writer in the New Testament, writing every book from Romans to Philemon, and at the very least inspiring the book of Hebrews, as well as being the central focus of the last half of the book of Acts. This man who in Acts 13.9 shifted from his Jewish identity as Saul, the identity he carefully and aggressively constructed, and adopted the Greek version of his name, Paul, so that he could be used by God to bring salvation to the Gentiles and indeed to the ends of the earth, as it says in Isaiah 49 and 6. It's by Paul's hand that our theology is reaffirmed, for he wrote in Philippians 2, 5-11, Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it something to be held on to to be equal with God, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's by Paul's hand that the foundations of our faith are reaffirmed. For he wrote in Romans 6, 23, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's by Paul's hand that our salvation is reaffirmed. For he said in Romans 10, 9, That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's by Paul's hand that the miracle of our salvation is reaffirmed. For he wrote in Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, 
lest anyone should boast. It's by Paul's hands that the security of our salvation is reaffirmed. For he wrote in Romans 8 and 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And it's by Paul's hand that our future is reaffirmed. For he said in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will arise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And Paul would not have been able to write any of this if Ananias had not been obedient and gone where the Lord told him to go. Billions of people have been brought to Christ by Paul's work because Ananias went where he was led. Brothers and sisters, the conclusion of this message is that you never know what God's plan is when he tells you to go. He may be sending you to save a neighborhood. He may be sending you to save a community. He may be sending you to save a city. Or he may be sending you to save one person. And that one person will save the masses. We never know what God is up to. So we got to go when he tells us to go. Jesus said, the labor is great, but the workers are few. Pray, therefore, that the Lord send workers into the field. He's sending us and we have to go. We have to go and proclaim this gospel so that people can be changed and receive everlasting life. We have to go so that we can demonstrate and experience the awesomeness of God's glory. And we have to go because we never know what God has planned and what marvelous things our work will accomplish. Even if we just reach one person, that one person can reach 1,000, and 1,000 will reach a million, and a million will reach a billion. So we have to go. We have to go where the Spirit leads. I'll leave you with these last few words from the Lord Jesus. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us. We hope that you are blessed and you are pumped and ready for worship service with your church. As you go about your day, please remember that there's lots of ways you can uplift your community. Just pray about what God would have you do and go for it. We all need each other right now, so let's help each other out. I'm Amani Winstead. Signing off for Just Love In Person.